Buckle up for a truly astonishing tale, complete with mind-bending revelations that'll leave you shocked and baffled. Don't miss a single detail. Stick around until the end. If you relish stories like this, consider supporting our young channel by hitting that subscribe button. And if this gripping account leaves you on the edge of your seat, please give us a thumbs up. We'll greatly appreciate your support. All right, let's dive into the extraordinary. Hi there. What I'm about to tell you might sound like a fever dream cooked up by a sleep-deprived college student, but I swear on everything I hold dear, it's the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. It all started with a camping trip, me and my girlfriend, let's just call her Kim, that is not her real name. Well, we were young and dumb, blissfully unaware of the cosmic curveball life was about to throw our way. Picture this, crisp mountain air, crackling campfire, the Milky Way sprawled across the velvet darkness. Textbook postcard perfect. Except the postcard ripped in half when we woke up the next morning, disoriented, clothes rumpled, and with a gaping hole in our memories where the previous day should have been. We brushed it off as a weird shared dream, a glitch in the matrix, but a niggling unease settled in our gut, a premonition of things to come. Back in the familiar chaos of college life, things got weirder. Kim, normally the picture of health, started experiencing these unexplainable physical oddities, dizzy spells, nausea, heightened sensitivity to light. Then came the bombshell, pregnant. Impossible. She was on the pill, religiously. The doctors were as confused as us, their test revealing nothing out of the ordinary. Yet as the weeks ticked by, the strangeness intensified. Kim's body became a battleground, her health fluctuating like a runaway roller coaster. One week she'd be glowing, energetic, the next pale and listless. The baby inside her, meanwhile, seemed to be defying the laws of biology, growing at an alarming rate. The ultrasound session was disturbing, before Kim and I knew what we were looking at, the technician ended the session. She seemed disturbed. She left. No explanations given. Both Kim and I were beyond bewildered, bordering on desperation. My countless calls to the specialist's office only yielded the frustrating response. Doctor is busy. He will call you back. But that call never came. Determined to uncover the truth hidden in those ultrasound images, I took matters into my own hands. Parking myself near his car after his workday, the specialist was visibly shocked to find me there. There was no subtlety in my approach. I practically tried to force an answer from him. His bewildered expression shifted as he hesitated before urging, tell your wife to get an abortion. That's all I got from him, nothing more. His profound fear caught my attention. I couldn't fathom why he seemed so terrified about our baby's unusual condition. Then the arrival of a black van nearby intensified his distress. His eyes fixated on it, and the fear seemed to double. As I left, deliberately passing close to the van, the driver's window lowered. Two men in suits and sunglasses shot me an eerie look. As the doctor drove away, the van started up following him ominously into the unknown. The fear gnawed at me, a constant unwelcome companion. It was this creeping sense of being watched, a feeling like unseen eyes were tracking our every move. Then came that night in the apartment. We woke up, not to the comforting hum of the fridge or the distant sirens of the city, but to a bone-chilling silence, broken only by the frantic thumping of our hearts. In the inky blackness, a presence loomed, unseen but undeniable, radiating an oppressive dread that seeped into our very bones. I am telling you, that night there was more than us in that apartment. Only the Lord knows what that presence was, but it felt otherworldly. We fled that night, seeking refuge in Kim's parents' house, the unease clinging to us like a second skin. That's when I started getting anxiously suspicious about the gap in our memories, the night out camping in the wild. 
the pieces started falling into place, like the strangeness of that event, the unexplainable pregnancy, the constant feeling of being watched. They all pointed towards something, not of this world. The doctor's frantic instance on more tests, his desperate pleas for termination. What further fueled my suspicion is that the doctor always had excuses not to see us or kept the sessions ridiculously short, never giving any clear answers to any of our questions. To myself, I wondered if it was his way to punish me for the time I creeped up to him in the parking lot, or if he was hiding something from us. Possibly both. This wasn't a normal pregnancy, this was something else entirely. God knows what. Kim, bless her heart, refused to listen. Motherhood blazed in her eyes, a fierce determination that trumped logic and fear. She was going to have this baby, no matter what the test said, no matter what dark secret it held. Eventually, I decided it's better to let her live her naive dream. Denial can be bliss. I was hoping that she is right. I was hoping it's merely me being paranoid. If the baby was abnormal, we will have it anyway, if that is what she wanted. The climax arrived like a sucker punch. Kim went into early labor, the doctors acting frantic, their faces etched with worry. Then came those two men in suits, their expressions unreadable, barring my entry to the delivery room like guardians of some forbidden secret. It was like they were hiding something, something terrifying. When they finally let me in, it was over. The baby, they claimed, died during the procedure. We never saw the body, some fabricated story about a mix-up, an admin error. A wave of relief washed over me, an undeniable sensation despite the crushing grief clawing at my insides, a hollowness echoing in my chest. Kim was devastated. It was slow, but time heals all and she recovered. The years that followed were a haze. Marriage, three beautiful normal children, a life built on laughter and love. We tried to build normalcy and succeeded to a large extent, and that is our story. Yet it does not end there. Sometimes I wish it did. Ignorance would have been a simpler path. Something was off. It was both of us. Shared nightmares became our unwelcome souvenir. We never spoke of them, but the knowing glances confirmed our mutual torment. Weeks of normalcy could be shattered by a single morning, both of us awakening as if we'd relived that night in the wilderness. Every time both of us at the same time, its synchronized nature was disturbing. These random nightmares could come at any time. It couldn't continue. When our youngest, barely five, noticed our erratic behavior, his innocent question cut deep. Why are mommy and daddy in such a bad mood some mornings? Desperate for answers, we confided in a trusted psychologist. He suspected suppressed joint trauma and referred us to a hypnotherapist and her practice partner. Our separate but simultaneous sessions with the two hypnotherapists uncovered the horror. It all came out, or most of it in any case, or so we believe. Gosh, I think we would have preferred the amnesia. The memories were horrific. The oppressive silence of the woods, the sudden blinding light that filled our tent, the feeling of weightlessness as we were lifted skyward, the colossal metallic craft hovering silently above. Then came the figures themselves, tall and slender with elongated limbs and skin that seemed to shimmer in the otherworldly light. Their faces, shrouded in shadow, radiated an unsettling calm, their movements devoid of human emotion, their large almond-shaped black eyes. That is one thing that I can't get out of my mind since the regression sessions. And of course, those creepy six-fingered hands touching everywhere. The details were terrifyingly clear. The sterile examination rooms, the cold metal instruments, the unsettling hums and piercing screams. We were not the only ones. They forced us apart. They controlled our bodies and movement. We were taken to separate rooms where we endured unspeakable experiments. From me, they extracted samples, a primal instinct telling me it wasn't what later transpired with Kim. For her, they did something far more monstrous. 
invasive and unbelievable, manipulating her body and planting the unwelcome seed of that child. We didn't know their motives, but had to endure their cold touch and emotionless indifference. Emerging from the therapist's office, we clung to each other, trembling, tears mingling with the bitter sting of confirmation. Those fragmented memories finally coalesced into a horrifying whole, confirming our darkest suspicions. We weren't just abducted, we were subjects in some experiment, unwilling pawns in their grand design. Regular therapy sessions became our battleground, where we wrestled with the horrific memories and lingering trauma. Despite the semblance of normalcy we rebuilt, the shadows of our experience clung to the corners, whispers of what if clinging to the air. But the heaviest shadow loomed large, the baby, the one we lost. The burden became unbearable, a weight threatening to crush us both. I embarked on a mission for answers, tracking down the retired doctor across state lines. In a Sarasota restaurant, years etched on his face mirrored our own. He unveiled the truth, the six-digit codes on tiny limbs, the oversized head, the huge black eyes like bottomless voids. Each unsettling detail chipped away at our hope, while the revelation of its survival, spirited away by shadowy figures claiming government affiliation, plunged us into a new abyss of fear and confusion. There's more to the story, secrets too unsettling to share in the open. But one thing is clear, our journey wasn't over. The truth we found was just the beginning, a chilling prologue to a chapter yet unwritten. This wasn't a happily ever after, but a stark realization. Some mysteries claw their way back, demanding to be faced, even if the answers lead us deeper into the darkness. Regards, Peter Anonymous. The following strange story was sent to us from a retired farmer in New Zealand. Hi there. Your videos inspired me to share our story with you and your viewers. As a farmer, I faced a grim battle with a rare blood cancer, one that offered little hope for recovery. With the harsh reality of my condition looming over me, I made the tough call to forego treatment, accepting the uncertain road ahead with a heavy heart. In the weeks leading up to Christmas of the year in question, our secluded farm on New Zealand's South Island bore witness to a peculiar phenomenon. Strange lights danced across the evening skies, their erratic movements defying explanation. At first we mistook them for planes, but their sudden shifts and unpredictable patterns hinted at something more enigmatic. Our farm, nestled in solitude and isolation, seemed a world unto itself, far removed from the chaos of urban life. The sightings of these mysterious lights became our own private intrigue. We refrained from discussing it with anyone. One night, a week before Christmas, as we sat down for dinner, I noticed through the window a light descending on the paddock next to the house. When it touched the ground, I could see it was a disc-shaped craft. Instinct kicked in, and I reached for my trusted hunting rifle, hands quivering with a blend of fear and determination. But before I could even grasp it, they emerged, creatures straight out of a nightmare, their insect-like forms contorting in the dim light of our home. There they were right inside our lounge. No idea how they so suddenly entered. It's like they just materialized. Their presence suffocated the air. It felt like the gaze of these four beings pierced one's very person. We were in a state of hypershock. Sarah stood behind me, arms protectively enveloping our daughter. Sarah recalls our innocent Lily seemed wondrously amused by the creatures while Sarah and I was in a state of pure anxiety and dread. We stood frozen, trapped by an invisible grip, unable to break free from the fear that held us in place. Despite my efforts, my limbs refused to obey, rendering my weapon useless against the encroaching darkness. I don't think any words can describe what was going through my mind at that time. While you are reading or listening to this, imagine for a while being in such a bizarre and threatening situation. 
While doubting my eyesight at that moment, in fact doubting my very sanity, I simultaneously am confronted with protecting my wife and child against creatures that can simply materialize or dematerialize as they please. All of this while they control my body, rendering me absolutely incapable of my duty as protector of my young family. The entire thing is simply too ghastly to describe. That experience left a lasting mark on me. As swiftly as they had appeared, they vanished, leaving us trembling in the wake of their inexplicable visitation. This eerie experience was a chilling reminder of our vulnerability in the vast expanse of the unknown. As Christmas Eve enveloped us, the air buzzed with the anticipation of the cherished family gathering and festive merriment the following day. Our joint families were driving all the way to spend Christmas Day at our place, stay over the night and drive back on Boxing Day. Despite the shadow cast by my illness, we had painstakingly prepared for the occasion, fueled by the promise of love and laughter that awaited us. Sarah, ever the embodiment of resilience, orchestrated the culinary symphony in the kitchen with practiced finesse. The aroma of roasting turkey and freshly baked pies wafted through the air, a tantalizing preview of the warmth and joy that awaited us on the morrow. Yet beneath the facade of holiday jubilation lurked a solemn reality, a truth I had grudgingly come to terms with. This would be my final Christmas, a poignant reminder of life's transience and the relentless march of time. The events of the previous week were still on our minds, but as it caused no harm except for freaking us out, we decided that we will not let it feature in our thoughts for the next few days, if only it was going to be that simple. As the night wore on and darkness blanketed our home, a disturbance shattered the tranquility. I jolted awake, a sense of disquiet creeping through me like a silent specter in the night. Emerging from the comfort of my bed, I stumbled into the enveloping darkness, my heart pounding like a drum in my chest as I bore witness to a sight that terrified me. One of those very same otherworldly creatures was in our house. As I stood in the hallway, I saw it slipping into Lily's room like a phantom in the night. It seemed not to notice me, or maybe it was simply not bothered by my presence. Fear spurred me onward my footsteps resounding through the silent corridors as I hastened to my daughter's side, only to find her bed and room empty. They have taken her. But how? Panic seized me then. I grasped for the phone, desperate for aid in the face of the unknown. But fate, it seemed, had different plans, as the telephone lines remained eerily silent. They were dead. Their familiar hum was replaced by a chilling stillness. Beside me, Sarah stood, her features etched with a blend of fear and disbelief. We found ourselves adrift in a sea of uncertainty, our world unraveling with each passing moment. Suddenly, there was a flash of light. I thought it was the craft outside taking off, whisking our daughter away. Only the Lord knows where to. And then, as if beckoned by some unseen force, a wave of dizziness swept over us. The next moment I felt sick. I remember Sarah saying her head is spinning. Strangely, we both fell unconscious, right there by the phone, both of us at the same time. If it was not so strange, I would have said our collapse was brought on by sheer shock, but I firmly believe it was something else. Look, both Sarah and I, even amidst my illness, were pretty level-headed people. We're not the type to simply faint. The morning broke with the events of the night before veiled in a haze of uncertainty. As awareness slowly returned, I found solace beneath the covers, Sarah's reassuring presence by my side offering comfort in the midst of turmoil. The covers? In bed? How did we get to bed? My last memory was of us losing consciousness in the hall by the phone, but then a worse memory. Lily, they've taken Lily. Then something unexpected and beautiful happened. A sweet, innocent voice beckoned us from our slumber, drawing us to the warmth of the lounge. There, bathed in the soft morning light, sat Lily, 
her laughter a melody that chased away the dread and fear. Relief washed over us like a tidal wave, cleansing our hearts of doubt and anxiety. She was safe, untouched by the darkness that had threatened to consume us. We held her close. Her embrace was the ultimate gift I would receive on that Christmas day. As we basked in the joy of her presence, a sense of peace settled over our home, a peace forged by the unbreakable bonds of family. We never discussed the events of the previous night or days with our family. Despite the horrific events leading up to our Christmas, the day itself turned out a beautiful experience of love and joy. As it was going to be my last, I only wanted to focus on making that Christmas the best memory for Sarah, Lily, and our folks. We kept it that way throughout the festive season. New Year's came and was another joyous event with friends and family. Yet, after that life had to return to its normal routine, and with that returned the doubt and fear. Beneath the surface, a lingering doubt nagged at us, a question unanswered. What had truly transpired on that fateful night? And why did Lily's memories remain veiled in mystery, her innocence untainted by the chaos that had engulfed us? We sought answers as the new year broke. Without revealing too much, as we did not want them to think we were crazy, we had Lily checked out by a pediatrician and a psychologist. Both found her to be in excellent health and zero sign of trauma of any kind. So, the truth remained elusive. Lily, a beacon of hope, stood unwavering in her innocence, her laughter a reminder of the resilience of youth in the face of uncertainty. However, her apparent lack of any trauma amidst what happened to her puzzled us. Yet, we were grateful our daughter was unscathed by whatever happened to her. Then February came, and it was time for my visit to the oncologist. Even though I knew what the path forward looked like, these visits were required to manage my condition as best as the clinicians could. I steeled myself for the tests and examinations. Blood was taken and we had to be back for a follow-up the next day. I prepared for the inevitable affirmation that the cancer is staying its course. My only dread was that it might be speeding up, which would mean even less time with my family. When the specialist finally entered with an expression of confusion, I knew he had further bad news for us. Then, our world changed. His words, when they came, shattered the darkness like a beam of light. Your cancer is gone. I will never forget his words. I remember him saying something like, You are extraordinarily lucky. This type of cancer simply does not disappear by itself. Besides, Severe cases like yours have never been successfully treated, yet here you are, clean, without any treatment. More tests were done, but they all confirmed the same. It was a miracle, pure and simple, a reprieve from the brink of death that defied all reason. Jubilation surged through me as we made our way home, hope and gratitude intertwining in a dance of newfound life. Yet with all that I had to celebrate, something was unresolved. At the edges of my consciousness, something was awakening, an unwelcome guest in the midst of celebration. And then, like a storm on the horizon, the nightmares descended, a relentless onslaught of visions and memories, each more nightmarish than the last. Strange lights and alien faces haunted my dreams, their presence a specter that loomed over me in the dead of night. With each passing day, the memories grew more vivid, more visceral, until the terror etched into my being. I relived the ordeal in agonizing detail, the chill of extraterrestrial surgical instruments, the searing pain of probing incisions, grotesque needles and more, all inflicted by beings that seemed devoid of empathy or remorse. Amidst the darkness, a paradox emerged. It was bittersweet. For within their cruelty, the insectoid creatures bestowed upon me a gift beyond measure, a second chance at life earned through pain, sheer dread, and horror. 
The ordeal is too harrowing to recount in further detail. I cannot fathom why the creature subjected me to such torment. Lily, now married with three beautiful children, remains as joyful and vibrant as ever, untouched by the events that transpired all those years ago. Despite undergoing regression hypnosis at our urging, she recalls nothing of significance. Curiously, it appears she was never abducted. Sarah and I seem to have manufactured memories of searching for her at home. Sarah never developed any nightmares or memories even remotely like mine. After all our anxieties about the apparent abduction of Lily, it seems that I was the only one who got taken. The motives behind the creature's actions remain shrouded in mystery. Nevertheless, their intervention led to my survival. Faced with the choice between enduring these haunting memories and succumbing to cancer, is there truly a choice? Thousands of beautiful memories created by a long and fulfilling family life have made the horror of the abduction 100% worth it. Yours, Joe. We received a chilling account from a brave individual who endured a harrowing encounter with enigmatic beings from another world. In this video, we delve into the spine-tingling story of their abduction and the shocking twist that left us questioning the nature of such abductions. I hope this letter finds you well. I wanted to share an experience with you. Something that happened to me one fateful night that still sends shivers down my spine whenever I think about it. It was a late weekend night and I found myself driving down a desolate stretch of road, surrounded by farms and dense forestry. The full moon bathed the landscape in an eerie silver glow and I was deep in the heart of nowhere. As I continued my journey, I noticed an unusual light in my rearview mirror. At first, I dismissed it, thinking it was either another vehicle or the radiant full moon casting unusual shadows. However, my unease grew when a sharp beam of light suddenly engulfed my car. Panic coursed through my veins as my vehicle began losing power, the engine sputtering to a halt and every electrical system shutting down. With trepidation, I stepped out of my car to investigate the source of this mysterious light. What I encountered next would defy all reason and logic. A flying saucer, yes, a UFO. The sight was unlike anything I had ever seen. It had landed right in the middle of the road. My heart raced as I watched in awe and terror as three small gray beings emerged from the craft. I know this might sound unreal, but the experience was real and simply terrifying. These beings were small, no taller than three feet, with slender bodies and a gray complexion. Their heads were disproportionately large, featuring oversized, pitch-black, almond-shaped eyes that shimmered with an otherworldly intelligence. They only had the slightest of noses and what seemed like slits for ears. Their mouths were also subtle, lipless slits. Their fingers were long and delicate. These small but scary beings were clad in sleek, form-fitting bodysuits that bore an eerie, jet-black hue. The fabric seemed to adhere closely to their diminutive frames, emphasizing their slender and otherworldly appearances. These suits appeared to be made of a material unlike any I had ever encountered, possessing a peculiar sheen that hinted at an advanced and unfamiliar technology. The texture of the suits had an almost metallic quality to them, adding to the otherworldly aura that surrounded these beings. It was as if these beings, dressed in their enigmatic black suits, were emissaries from a realm that defied human comprehension, leaving me with more questions than answers. As they approached me, walking with an uncanny grace, I felt a strange sensation wash over me, as if they were communicating with me through some form of telepathy. They moved in unison, their movements fluid and synchronized. Without uttering a word, they conveyed a sense of urgency, gently guiding me toward the entrance of their craft. 
It was as if they had the ability to exert control over my actions, making resistance futile. The hypnotic spell they cast upon me left me with no choice but to follow their lead, stepping through the metallic threshold of their enigmatic vessel and into an entirely new and unsettling reality. Inside the alien craft, I found myself in a room that defied any earthly description. The walls seemed to be constructed from a seamless, silvery metallic material, casting an otherworldly shimmer across the entire chamber. There were no discernible corners or edges, creating an unsettling feeling of disorientation. The room was bathed in a soft, bluish light that emitted from concealed sources, casting eerie shadows in every direction. In the center of the room lay a peculiar silvery metal slab, its surface smooth and polished to a mirror-like sheen. The slab had restraints of an unknown design, composed of a material that resembled a translucent, gel-like substance. These restraints seemed to respond to the touch of the aliens, conforming perfectly to the contours of my body as they secured me in place. It was as if the slab itself was a living entity, adapting to their will. Surrounding the slab were an array of strange and intricate instruments unlike anything found in human technology. Some emitted faint, rhythmic hums, while others displayed holographic readouts that I couldn't comprehend. Tubes and wires snaked across the room, connecting to various devices, and it became clear that I was the subject of their experiments. The atmosphere was charged with an otherworldly energy, and my fear was palpable as I lay helpless on the metallic surface, unable to comprehend the full extent of what was about to transpire. The aliens surrounded me while I was on the slab. One of them pulled down a mechanic arm with a kind of needle extending from it. He brought it towards my eyes. At first, I freaked out, but then my faith kicked in. As I am a spiritual person, I knew I had only one resort of help to turn to, and it is because of my faith that I discovered a peculiar phenomenon. Every time I called out to my Creator and began to pray, something incredible happened. It was as if a divine presence filled the room, and I became certain that the Creator Spirit was with me. My prayers seemed to unnerve my captors, and I realized that my faith was a powerful weapon against them. Their fear was palpable, and it was evident that they were afraid of something far greater than themselves. It seemed to terrify them. With each prayer, they backed away, unable to withstand the spiritual force that protected me. As I continued to pray fervently, an astonishing and unexpected sight unfolded before my eyes. One of the little gray aliens, the one closest to me, suddenly exhibited signs of intense fear and distress. Its large, almond-shaped eyes widened even further, and it began to emit high-pitched, distressed sounds that I can only describe as a mixture of chattering and whimpering. In a shocking turn of events, the alien's body language conveyed sheer terror, and to my astonishment, it began to involuntarily urinate, causing its tight suit to become soaked with a pale liquid. The liquid pooled around its feet, creating a strange and unsettling scene within the sterile metallic chamber. It was as if my prayers had triggered a profound and unexpected reaction within the creature, revealing a vulnerability I could never have anticipated. This bizarre and surreal moment served as a reminder that, despite their advanced technology and seemingly superior knowledge, these extraterrestrial beings were not immune to fear, and there were forces beyond their understanding that could instill terror even in the most enigmatic of creatures. It was a turning point in my harrowing ordeal, as I realized that my faith had the power to influence and protect me in ways I could never have imagined. In a twist of fate, they eventually released me, dumping me by the side of the road not far from where they had abducted me. As I watched their craft disappear into the night sky, I couldn't help but feel a profound sense of awe and gratitude for the divine intervention that had saved me from an unimaginable fate. 
This experience has forever changed my perspective on the mysteries of the universe. It serves as a reminder that, even in the face of the unknown and the terrifying, there is a force greater than anything we can comprehend, a force that shields us from the darkest of terrors if we turn towards it. Thank you for taking the time to read my account of this inexplicable encounter. It's a story that continues to both haunt and inspire me, and I felt compelled to share it with you. Sincerely, David. Welcome back to our channel. We recently received the following story from a married couple in South Africa. Hi. Inspired by the chilling tale of the Balinese sea demon featured on your channel, I felt a pressing need to share the extraordinary experience that Marilise, my fiancé at the time, our fox terrier Joey and I, had on a secluded beach in South Africa during the 1980s. This adventure, far removed from the era of instant digital communication, unfolded in a time when the mysterious still held sway over remote places. Our destination was a pristine stretch of beach along the South African south coast, known only to a few locals. This beach, hemmed in by imposing sand dunes and miles of wild bush belonging to a nature reserve, promised the perfect escape from the bustle of everyday life. The first few days were idyllic, filled with the simple pleasures of camping, cooking over an open fire, fishing along the shoreline, and the comforting sound of waves breaking on the shore. However, our sense of peace was disrupted one afternoon when we noticed something highly unusual, a strange cigar-shaped object hovering distantly over the ocean. It was unlike any aircraft we were familiar with, and it lingered there for hours, filling us with an uneasy sense of intrigue. It defied any conventional explanation, appearing too stable and solid to be a mirage, yet its distance was impossible to gauge. We speculated whether it could be a spacecraft from another world, but just as we were trying to make sense of it, the object vanished as if it had never been there. That evening, our sense of unease intensified. Unusual lights, which some nowadays might call orbs, appeared near our tent on the dunes, moving in inexplicable patterns. Their origin and nature were beyond our understanding, and their proximity sparked a growing concern within us. Thankfully, they kept their distance. Joey, our usually vocal fox terrier, responded not with barks, but with a silent, fixated gaze, an atypical behavior that only heightened the strangeness of the moment. Marilise clung tightly to my arm, her grip a mix of fear and fascination. Together, we watched, unable to tear our eyes away from the mesmerizing display. The lights pulsed and shifted, casting an ethereal glow around our campsite, before they disappeared into the night's embrace. Isolated as we were, with our campsite a considerable distance from the car and enveloped in darkness, I suggested to Marilise that we should consider leaving at first light. The strangeness of our experience had escalated beyond a comfortable threshold, and I felt a pressing responsibility for our safety. The morning unfolded with a picturesque haze blanketing the beach, the air fresh and tinged with the vibrant scent of the sea. The waves lapped gently at the shore, a serene backdrop to our simple ritual of enjoying a steaming cup of coffee paired with rusks, a timeless South African tradition. In that tranquil moment, the stunning beauty of the South Coast was truly awe-inspiring, promising a perfect day for fishing. Regardless of the events of the previous day, Marilise and I decided to stay until the afternoon. However, as I savoured the last sips of my coffee, the peculiarity of the previous night revisited us. In the distance, two figures could be seen making their way along the beach toward our spot. Initially, they appeared to be just fellow beachgoers, perhaps out for a morning stroll. Their pace was unhurried, almost leisurely at times. Yet, as they drew nearer, their movement slowed further, revealing an eeriness to their approach. It was then that the oddity of their appearance truly struck me, sending a shiver down my spine. Their slender bodies, about my height, were entirely grey, their colour almost merging with the misty backdrop of the coast. Their skin, 
or perhaps it was some form of tightly fitting attire, was adorned with green, organic-like patterns that subtly shifted as they moved. Their large, featureless eyes added to their alien appearance, making it impossible to discern any gender. They eventually stopped about 200 meters away from us, close enough for us to realize their oddity, yet too far to discern any finer details. The most disconcerting aspect of these figures were those large, expressionless eyes, which seemed to be fixed on us. As mentioned before, this was a highly secluded beach rarely visited by people, so at that moment, we felt utterly alone with whatever these beings were. I had already resolved to pack up and leave, even before they got too close, but Marilise, pointing towards them, drew my attention to something peculiar. Joey, too, had noticed the figures and was intently observing them. Yet, in a departure from her usual behaviour, she remained silent, her gaze fixed on them, but without any sign of agitation. Marilise, who was studying anthropology at university in those days, found her initial apprehension giving way to a deepening intrigue in these otherworldly people. I kept a watchful eye on the figures as I hurriedly gathered our fishing equipment. One of them had now seated itself on the sand, gazing out at the sea, while the other appeared to be observing the seagulls flying overhead. I wondered if they were merely pretending not to be too interested in us. With Joey, Calm and Marilisa's interest piqued, and the two beings seemingly absorbed in surroundings, I reconsidered our hasty departure. Though very strange, there was an unusual sense of calm in the air. At times, it felt like a palpable energy that was emitted by them and amplified by the sereneness of the natural environment itself. Then I thought, why waste a beautiful day for fishing? In any case, my own curiosity was beginning to outweigh my initial unease. Marilise tried to capture this extraordinary encounter with her camera. However, each time she aimed at the figures, they would vanish from the frame, only to materialise again as soon as she lowered the camera. It was a baffling phenomenon that added to the surreal nature of our experience. In an effort to alleviate our lingering apprehension and restore some semblance of normality, Marilise suggested we continue fishing. To our surprise, the figures kept their distance, occasionally glancing our way with what seemed like a dispassionate curiosity. This strange impasse enveloped us in an almost otherworldly sense of peace, leaving us to wonder if we were witnessing visitors from another realm, their purpose as mystifying as their presence. Then, the atmosphere took a sudden, alarming turn. Joey abruptly rose and dashed towards the water's edge, barking and growling with an intensity I'd never seen in her before. Her focus was fixed on the waves. Our otherworldly visitors, who had since moved further away and were seated at a distance, sprang to their feet, their attention drawn to the same spot that had captivated Joey. What followed was a scene straight out of a nightmare. A grotesque creature, reminiscent of the Balinese sea demon from your video, emerged from the waves. It was a massive entity, the size of a small trailer, and it bore a terrifying resemblance to a gigantic crustacean or arachnid. With menacing pincers akin to those of a crab or scorpion, it charged out of the water, heading straight for Joey. The creature moved with a disturbing agility, its intent clear and frightening. As we prepared to rush forward in a desperate attempt to save our dog, I noticed that our strange visitors were now much closer, about 50 meters away. One of them raised an arm, and from his palm, a violet light shot out, striking the creature. The beast recoiled as if electrocuted, emitted an unearthly sound, and hastily retreated back into the sea. Our greenish-gray visitors sprang into action without a moment's delay. Pursuing the creature, they waded into the water until they were knee-deep, and that's when something extraordinary happened. A bizarre blue energy bubble formed around them, similar in design to the larger structure we had observed above the sea the previous day, albeit much smaller. They positioned themselves inside the bubble, which then transitioned from being translucent to a solid silver color. This structure, seemingly, was a craft of some sort, for a moment, it moved like a boat tracing the path taken by the crab-like creature. Before our eyes, it dove beneath the waves, disappearing just as abruptly and mysteriously as the creature it had pursued. We stood there, 
frozen, trying to comprehend the surreal and terrifying events that had just unfolded before us. Still reeling from shock and disbelief, we quickly grabbed Joey and began to pack our belongings with a sense of urgency. The need to distance ourselves from that beach and the enigmatic events that unfolded was overwhelming. The entire drive home was engulfed in a heavy silence, with each of us immersed in our own thoughts, attempting to process the surreal experiences we had just endured. That encounter has etched itself indelibly into our memories, constantly challenging our perception of the world as we know it. In the aftermath, we often speculated about the intentions of our two mysterious visitors. It seemed they were waiting for the appearance of that crab spider-like creature. Were they there to protect us? Or were we unwittingly used as bait in some strange cosmic game? The true motive behind their actions remained an enigma. All these years, we've been haunted by so many questions. Who were the green-gray beings? Where did they come from? What was their purpose? And the creature that emerged from the sea? It was something out of a horror tale. What was it? We were grateful that it never crossed our paths again. That is until I watched your video on the Balinese sea demon, which brought back a flood of memories and a chilling sense of familiarity. It's a story we've rarely shared, but one that continues to resonate with us, a testament to the enigmatic mysteries of nature. Yours sincerely, John.